All right, I think we'll go ahead. Um, so just I'll introduce uh, so myself. Uh, so my name is David Gottfried. I'm the deputy director of the NNCI coordinating office. I want to welcome you to another of our semi-monthly uh, NNCI webinars. Um, this particular webinar is in our computation series. And uh, in a moment, I'll turn it over to my colleague Azad to introduce today's speaker. Um, just a word about future events. So we actually do have uh, several more events coming up in, in May. Um, and you can see what those are if you go to the events page on the NNCI website. So the NNCI website is nnci.net. Um, and you can also view for those events which were recorded, and all of our webinars have been recorded, and this one is being recorded as well. Um, you can view past recordings on our YouTube channel. And if you just Google YouTube and NNCI, it is the number one choice that comes up. So you can find that easily. And with that, I will mute myself and turn it over to my colleague Azad to introduce today's speaker. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the NNCI computation webinar series. I'm Azad Naimi at Georgia Tech. Uh, and uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Gerhard Klimek. Uh, professor Klimek is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Purdue University, uh, director of the Network for Computational Nanotechnology and Riley Director of the Center for Predictive Materials and Devices. Um, he has helped to create nanohop.org, the largest virtual nanotechnology user facility serving over 2 million global users annually. Uh, he's a fellow of the Institute of Physics, the American Physical Society, the IEEE, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's published over 500 scientific articles, has been recognized for co-invention of a single atom transistor, quantum mechanical modeling theory, and simulation tools. His NEMO 5 software has been used since 2015 at Intel to design nanoscale transistors. Today, the title of his talk is Semiconductor Workforce Development Through Immersive Simulations on nanohop.org. So with that, I turn it to Professor Klimek. Thank you, Adan. So thank you for letting me uh, present. So uh, my goal is really to give you a bit of an overview of nanohub, how uh, we look at it for having impact and how we measure impact and what in general people can do. And what I'd like to do then is actually give you a demo that is reasonably interactive, uh, where you can also ask questions about um, the <clears throat> tools we have on NanoApp specifically for uh, educating semiconductor um, students and researchers. So uh, let me just um, highlight briefly the homepage of NanoHub. So uh, we have sort of a model of making data <clears throat> and simulation pervasive. The real idea is to make uh, research results duplicatable and really enabling uh, the transition of research <laughs> results into education and into other research venues. So we overall, we want to enable people to model and simulate. We have now actually over 700 tools and apps in NanoHub. We uh, want to foster learning and teaching and I'll highlight the simulation power curricula, the courses we have. We also enable people to develop software on NanoHub with NanoHub and to ultimately then publish uh, the tools or teaching materials and lectures, et cetera, on NanoHub. So I'll, I'll talk a lot about the semiconductor workforce development for semiconductor devices, but let me, um, give you a brief overview of who's on NanoHub and what are we generally doing and how do we measure impact. So there's over 2.1 million users annually. We have over 2,400 contributors. And we're at some point measured that we're at 172 countries and it's typically faculty, students and industry practitioners. What's there? It's uh, over 700 apps and tools. Uh, that are nanotechnology, semiconductor based and other related areas. There's over 6,500 lectures and tutorials. There's over 170 courses. So we have been a, a massively online courseware for many years now. And it is a cyber infrastructure that is operational 
uh, 24-7. Our downtime uh, has been, or uptime has been 99.4% last year. That corresponds to about 20 to 25 hours a year that we are down. So it's really a, an infrastructure that's up and running all the time. We measure impact by how uh, people use us in the classroom. And uh, uh, we have uh, demonstrated in terms of simulation tool usage over 89,000 students that have used us in the classroom uh, at over 185 institutions. And I'll show you how we can change curriculum really fast with an adoption rate of less than six months. We measure impact also by having created a new type of publication. So non-web tools are now listed in the web of science as a proper publication next to papers that we all know. And um, Google Scholar followed suit relatively soon after the web of science. So we listed there as well. We also measure research impact by people that cite NanoHub in the literature with their papers. So we identify 2,500 papers that cite NanoHub. And uh, at some point, people doubted that you can even use a NanoHub-like site to do research or real research. So that's why I started tracking these citations. And then people said, well, it can't be good research. So I started tracking the secondary citations of these 2,500 papers or growing number of papers. And there's over 54,000 secondary citations now. So it's, it's uh, you can do good research too on Nano. So uh, what I want to focus on uh, for the, the most part now is uh, looking at this um, semiconductor workforce development, what can be done and giving you some demos. So we have this new landing site. If you click on this uh, logo here of the US uh, map of users or the, uh, this logo here on the front page, you get to a, a dedicated page that is uh, assembling content for workforce development. And what we're uh, strong at, and I'll highlight, oh, let me go back here. So I will talk a lot about these tools for using simulation. But I also want to highlight uh, a specific list of courses that we identified to be really relevant to this workforce development in terms of fundamentals of transistors. My grad class on uh, device fundamentals is in here. Fundamentals of current flow uh, from atoms to devices and um, thermal transport. So we have a variety of uh, open coursewares that are freely and open available in NanoHub. And going along with that, some of the tool uh, courses have new textbooks that were created. And they're somewhat similar to uh, the 1960s uh, seek nodes, which really uh, changed how um, or introduced semiconductors into classrooms. And uh, in many ways, most semiconductor device textbook, even today, follow this 60-year-old seek notes. So if you compare even modern textbook, they roughly follow the same pattern and instruction set. So these are now different and different in their approach, different of their way of thinking and different in their terms of their delivery. So Mark Lundstrom has been pushing for that quite a bit. So then we have apps. Uh, um, as I said, there's at least 600 now that deal with electronics and materials. Then we have something we call tools. Tools require more expertise uh, more knowledge on how to operate them versus the apps are really clickable. And I like to, I guess, boast that we created apps, scientific apps in 2005. That's two years before they came out uh, as apps as for all kinds of purposes in, on the iPhone. We're starting to partner with commercial uh, vendors. So we have MATLAB and ThermoCalc now in NanoHub open for everyone. And uh, we're talking with Silvaco right now. We also partner with um, groups uh, that create content uh, for NanoHub and for their own uh, communities, and we host it. And then uh, we have ongoing faculty engagements. Um, I just gave today another recitation um, to some 35 faculty members this morning to, uh, to help them adopt NanoHub into semiconductor education. So, <coughs> pardon me, that being said, uh, let me highlight this, this Abacus tool set and I'll demo it in a, in a, in a, in a little while. Um, so 
this is really uh, an assembly of multiple tools that all of these individual tools are, of course, available on NanoHub. But I'm a, Abacus is, in a sense, a one-stop shop, meaning if you're teaching semiconductors, you're typically doing uh, crystals, you're dealing with band structure, you're dealing with PN junctions, you're dealing with MOSCAPs and MOSFETs and maybe a BJT. And all of that is in one uh, assembly, so you don't have to hunt and peck on NanoHub. And that tool alone has now over 16,000 users and has been used in over 360 classes. And that is really the topic of this recitation series where I help faculty to adopt this in their classrooms. And we started this recitation last December. We had some 316 uh, participants from December to February in seven sessions, 192 individual faculty. And uh, there's about 46 um, participants in, in each session. We started a new one in April and running it to May. Uh, as I said, today I had the third one, typically now 35 on average or so. And we had uh, about 80 individual faculty members. The analytics are not quite complete yet. So what can you do or what do I demo? So here's a, an animation that we actually send along with the invitation to the first recitation series. So you see how you can visualize a simple silicon unit cell. That might be a textbook. You can make them bigger. You can have your students look into different crystal directions. You can introduce Miller planes and then um, have students uh, count bonds on atom, uh, on, on surfaces, et cetera, as an exercise or have them rotate the crystal into a specific direction, dump out the, the screenshot and that might be their homework assignment. Uh, another one that's very popular is this uh, PN Junction Lab where you can easily simulate different PN junctions under different doping conditions and forward and reverse bias. You can visualize the charge depletion region as a function of bias in forward and reverse. You can also look at total charges that you see here in forward bias and then also in reverse bias, how you really increase the depletion region. And um, then you can get an IV and the capacitance and forward reverse bias, and you can change parameters. So, so that's a quick walkthrough of what you can do in PN Junction Lab. That uh, those are and Crystal Viewer. Those are two tools uh, that we have in this Abacus uh, set. So, now I said we have over sixteen thousand users and over three hundred sixty classes. Counting users is relatively easy. I mean, people have to log in and we know that they use a certain tool, but how do you know that they're in a class? So we do this really by reasonably sophisticated data analytics of user behavior. For example, here is a, a, a plot of one analysis that we typically do. And on the horizontal axis, you have time and vertically you stack different users in time. So there might be a group that uh, used the yellow tool over say a, a week's worth of time, somewhat scattered. Here's another group that used the orange tool throughout a whole semester in a somewhat rhythmic pattern. And you can actually see spring break. And here's another group that uses one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different tools in a rhythmic pattern. So by user-user correlation of them using the same tools roughly from the same place at the same time, we can identify and count students in a classroom, even though they don't necessarily tell us that they're in a class because the site is totally open. We don't, uh, we don't approve people per se, faculty come and go and they tell their students to join. So uh, that's how we, we measure classroom sizes. And as I said, we had over 89,000 students in over 34, 3,600 courses. So the question now is how long does it take to change curriculum? And one way to, to do that is since every tool has a digital object identifier, you can call it a birthday, if you will, of um, when they're being published, I can measure the time from publication to the first time usage in a class, right? I would call that the adoption rate of a specific tool at the first time that it was used in a classroom. And the question is, how fast can you do that? And you should maybe compare that to 
a typical textbook update uh, that takes about four years to do. And if I put uh, NanoHub adoption data in here, we have tools that get adopted within a week and a month. Actually, the median adoption time a couple of years ago was actually less than six months. So you can indeed very fast change curriculum and infuse tools into classrooms. So then the next question is, um, what do these classes do? What do the students in these classes do? And uh, so here I'll walk you through the, um, the original somewhat older user interface of the PN Junction Lab that I already showed. So PN Junction Lab actually under the hood runs the Padre tool set. That is the uh, commercial equivalent from Bell Labs that used to design their transistors. So it's a real tool, it's not a toy. And if you hit uh, um, simulate here on and, and the tool, you can then get a, uh, um, a band edge diagram like this. And if you say change, for example, the doping here, change the doping to higher doping, you run simulate again, you get a different uh, band profile. And you can compare these two by clicking, for example, here on the all button and students can get some ideas on, on band bending, et cetera. And, and get a feeling for what it means to generate doping, etc. So that's that's what the tool does. The question now is, this is a brief demo, actually screenshots of a demo, but what do students really do? And I'm going to compare two different groups of, of users. I'll take a, a group of yellow users. Um, those are 19 users or students that ran 20 sessions overall 237 runs. So what I showed you here was a session where I had two runs. I had the original and then the second simulation. So I had two, what we would call runs. So these students here, um, roughly each student had one session. So they came once basically, and they run, ran about 10 things ballpark or 11 simulations each. So then there's another group the purple group, um, 18 users or students, they had 29 sessions. So roughly half the users, half the students came back for a second session and they roughly ran again, 10, 11 simulations uh, per sessions. So what can you do in this tool? Uh, in principle, you can change 17 parameters. It's an app. And here, this, these two classes actually changed uh, 10 parameters that deal with say the material itself, the, the length of the p-type, the intrinsic length, the n-type region, the intrinsic doping, uh, grid points, the temperature, applied voltage, and p-type doping. So, so they do a bunch of things. And here's something called a Sankey plot that identifies uh, the parameters that these um, students have used in the classroom. So this class examined uh, the intrinsic doping. Uh, they ramped it up from truly intrinsic to uh, something more heavy dope. They change different temperatures and they um, change different uh, doping profiles on the P side. So that gives you an idea of the sequence of runs they might have done as a, as a cohort of group. And the purple group behaved quite differently. They looked at um, actually the length of the intrinsic region. They varied that, they varied the intrinsic doping and they also uh, changed the applied biases and Mac uh, messed a little bit around on the P side. Few students also changed the material properties of indium phosphate and germanium and gallium arsenide. So that gives you an idea. These two classes actually behave quite differently. They can do different things. They ask different questions um, towards the tool that uh, the faculty member probably instructed them to look at various facets of, uh, of a PN junction. So. That gives you an idea of what people can do uh, and not only what they can do, but what they did do. And that gets me back sort of just to the to highlight here. And I'd like to uh, next just demo the site a little bit to give you an idea of what's there and uh, give you the demo of the tool. And then I'll, I'll open uh, maybe the conversations for questions in the chat, etc. So here's the NanoUp homepage. I kind of highlighted it already in the PowerPoint slide. Uh, if you click on any of this area here, you get to um, uh, 
a page that is uh, dedicated to this workforce development. It already looks slightly different, updated towards my PowerPoint slide. And as I said, we have these uh, simulators here. And the idea is really that we have a set of simulators that deal here with fundamentals of semiconductor devices. There's some TCAT tools that involve process modeling as well as device modeling and circuit modeling. Um, there's a tool set that deals with quantum mechanics for engineers. So if you want to learn about resonant tunneling diodes, quantum dots, quantization in uh, structures, and we're linking to a virtual reality um, immersive learning and, and a fab lab that we will transition into NanoHub as well. And we have short courses here also on machine learning. And this is a placeholder here. So we have a variety of um, tool sets. And I would like to focus here on this Abacus tool set. And this is the group page for Abacus. So you can always go NanoHub groups Abacus. You can reach it from the front page too. And it really deals with the fundamentals of semiconductors. So crystals, band structure, bulk semiconductors, PN junctions, bipolar junction transistors, MOS capacitors, and MOSFETs. So um, uh, each of these has uh, some, some bigger groups where there's homework assignment and group assignments, et cetera. Some animations that go along with these individual band structure models. And I'll, I'll try to demo some of these here uh, in a minute. So um, mass capacitors here, for example. So, uh, so there's a variety of elements. And if you're interested in the, um, the recitation series that deals um, with these uh, tutorials that I've uh, delivered uh, already, so they're all listed here. So these are each about 45 minutes or so of overviewing a tool and how it might be used. So you'll get the, the fire hose sort of today. So if I go to any one of these and um, say click on this, it actually brings me to the tool. So the tool is a publication. It has a DOI. It has authors. Um, it typically has an abstract. It might have some screenshots. And this one also links back to this group page that has all these other resources. So as you, uh, the site is open. Uh, anybody can get a login. You can log in with your uh, university credentials typically, or you can log in with Google, or you can create your own account. So I'm, I'm already logged in. If you hit uh, launch tool, it'll create a, uh, a view of a remote tool, and that's firing up right now. And uh, this is what the tool looks like. Um, I, I pre-cooked some examples that might take a, a longer time to, to simulate. Um, let me pop this one up here too. So here is the tool list again, and it's basically an assembly of tools, each of which of these tools is available on Nanolab. So you can go there as well by the web direct web addresses too. But uh, what I thought I'd, I'd like to do is um, show you a different way of, for example, explaining band structure. I mean, we have the um, periodic potential lab here too, where you can uh, basically have a periodic potential and you can change the various properties and you get the band structure out. You can, uh, for example, compare the dis resulting dispersion to a free electron. Um, you can modify the structures. You can look at different, um, different potentials. You can look at Coulombic potential. You can do all kinds of things in this periodic potential lab. But uh, so I use that in my class as well. But what I really like to use is actually this tool. And what I what I did here this is my tool. So I, I kind of like it, but that's you no. Know. So you can look at a transmission through a double barrier structure is my old friend, the resonant telling diode. And you can calculate a transmission coefficient. And I she used that in my class. I let them calculate a simple quantum mechanical scattering calculation of getting transmissions through single barriers and double barriers. And so at this resonance energy, you have perfect transmission and you get a peak and you get an excited peak here. Now I reran this uh, already. So if I take uh, three barriers, I now have a 
coupled quantum well, these states will split bonding, antibonding. The transmission will be one on these, uh, on these resonances. If I go further and actually increase the number of barriers to four, I have three wells, three transmission peaks, three peaks. If I actually go further to eight, you can clearly see how this transmission gets narrower and narrower, right? You start from, from pretty broad to getting narrow here. Look at the, how deep this guy is going down in the middle, getting deeper and deeper and deeper and the band is really well defined anywhere between eight and say 15 atoms so in my point of view and as an answer i had to a student at some point which was how many atoms does it take to generate band structure well you kind of get a feeling here that with some 16 barriers 15 atoms you clearly have a band and you have band structure so to me that is a much more powerful way to actually ex to explain band structure and the emergence of band structure rather than the periodic potential lab, which quite frankly, when I was a student, I could do the math just fine. I was really good with math, if I may say, but uh, I didn't understand it. In particular, I didn't quite understand what, what, what the implications of a block wave are, etc. So here you can do this. And what is even cooler, you can really explain block waves formation of band structure in a more fundamental way. Because what if I just said, let me consider this here as a string of 15 atoms. And I consider this now a particle in a box made up of 15 atoms in one dimension. What would the wave functions be? So let me walk you through the most simple box that we all know how to in principle calculate really easily. So here's a ground state, here's an excited state, right? And the, the wave function that you would get would look something like this. The ground state has a single lobe, the excited state has a double lobe, right? Just like that. And if you look at the potential energy, ooh, okay, so here's my double barrier structure. So it has a signal lobe and a double lobe up here, right? Now, if I go into the state here where I have uh, three barriers, then these two states split into bonding and antibonding, but they still peaked in the middle and it peaked in the middle. And here again, bonding and antibonding. But now you can really see also in the wave function, if you look at these four, the bonding one actually goes through the barrier. The antibonding one will have a minimum in the barrier and actually separate the wave function. So here, look at this. I'm putting my cursor on the peak. That's the antibonding one. And you can see that the bonding state actually nudges closer. The peak gets closer to here. And also it fills in this uh, the, into the barrier. So then the, the third state will be the bonding state of a double lobe that is truly strongly bonded. And the fourth one is an antibonding one where the peaks sort of repel each other. And again, the picture here is bonding, antibonding, bonding, antibonding. So now if you crank up into three barriers, you see there's a band forming here, the ground state is bonding. Again, four and eight, uh, 16 here. You can see how these bands are forming. So what would you expect in a particle in a box the wave function to look like. It should be basically an S-like orbital and that branches across this whole part, uh, this whole box, if, you, if your world only consisted of this box. So let's look at that. Here's the wave function. And indeed, you have an S-like overarching wave function. You can um, then look at the next state. That should be the, the particle in a box with um, two lobes. But notice how do you have these modulations for each quantum well or for each atom, if you will, that is uh, repeated in a sense, you have a block wave that is automatically superposed. It's actually meaningful. The third state has three lobes, the fourth one has four, and then it kind of gets messy in the middle of the band until you start to get to the top of the band where you have three lobes, two lobes, and one. And this is the anti-bonding one to the very ground state. So, the, so you can really see in a band on the bottom, you have the bonding states. On the upper one, you have the anti-bonding states. 
and you have the block functions come out for free. The next state up, the next band up, should be again a ground state like this, bonded over the whole structure, but it has double peaks, like the block states have double because the symmetry inside each quantum well is like that. The next one has two, three, four, five, and so on, until you get to the top of the band, where now you have the anti-bonding one. So really band structure in many ways is, is very simple and you can explain it really nicely and easily why these bands are wide, these ones are narrow in terms of uh, thickness of wells, etc. So you can really teach students band structure in a very, very simple way. Or if you prefer the chronic penny model or periodic potential model, you can also do it in this tool set as well. And you can actually have students overlay these EK diagrams from the discrete calculation and the quasi-continuum calculation as well. So what other cool things could you do? You can um, uh, look at, um, well, Band Structure Lab um, allows you to do band structure of real materials, silicon, gallium arsenide, et cetera. It also allows you to look at band structure in nanowires or ultra thin bodies, where you can actually tune effective mass. So actually in my class, I have a project assignment to one dealing with a quantum dot detector on NanoHub and the other one is designing a nano wire for certain properties under strain, et cetera. And they can use band structure lab to tune band structure, to tune effective mass, modify it such that the transistor has a favorable performance. Um, then uh, there's basic exercises like shining light on a semiconductor and seeing the current being generated. There's a tool on bipolar junction transistor and here's a, then a MOS, MOS capacitor where you can do, look at different uh, effects there. And here's a MOSFET lab. And what I did do here is I pre-cooked the simulation. I looked at a 100 nanometer channel um, standard MOS uh, device. I made the substrate shallow and the junction shallow enough such that you can actually uh, scale this thing down. Um, so. If I now go to say 65 nanometers, um, is it running it or it might cache the result or it might run the simulation. If it run it, if it runs it, it has a, uh, there we go, it, it runs it. So I, we have to wait a minute or two for the results to show up. Um, I thought it might have cached a solution already. So we usually store solutions of prior simulations so we don't have to rerun it. So this input deck here must be slightly different. Um, let me just highlight something I think is important. Um, we go to the P injunction lab. It's easy to be seen here. If I actually go in, just hit simulate it retrieves a, sim, uh, a simulation because it has been run many times. Um, one punchline I want to make is this runs a real honest to goodness simulation engine. It's not a toy. It's nothing pre-computed on analytical solutions. It's a, you would have to come up with an input deck in a commercial tool like Sovaco or Synopsys or Padre and conjure this up and then run the tool and extract the data at the end. So this is what the app does for you. So it's a real honest to goodness tool. The other thing I want to highlight is um, just last week I was teaching, two weeks ago, sorry, I had the students do some PN Junction um, homework exercises and they came back and said, look, uh, we ramp up the voltage here, but then for high voltages, why is this potential dropping here? And I can guarantee you that in no traditional textbook will you ever see a band edge profile properly drawn like this. Because this is a real tool and you cannot extract that simply from the typical analytical equations we, we teach. So I can walk through in the recitation session with the students as to figuring out why do you think this potential has to drop when the current goes high and you don't have enough electrons on, on this uh, P side or, or uh, over here. So it's, it's automatically this, this tool, this real honest to goodness semiconductor device tool gets resistive losses properly 
And you can talk about non-ideality is not as a fudge factor that be, is being patched into an IV, but it comes out of a real simulation in a meaningful way. And then you can also change relaxation rates um, in this tool. You can go in, and for example, make um, the relaxation goes just for argument's sake, make it really fast. And meaning um, the electrons that are being injected over here decay rather rapidly. So something should happen interesting to this quasi Fermi level. So I'm running this and this one, I, I guess I had run already. So now I can go to this energy band diagram and crank this down and see my Fermi level distribution is quite different. Uh, quasi Fermi levels, they, they do decay close to the depletion region. They don't even um, uh, touch, uh, go far into the bulk. And again, I can compare that to the other one uh, for uh, uh, a much uh, longer lifetimes. So, and I can uh, see the effects on the IV. I can put them next to each other. I can duplicate them. So. So if, the, um, if you have a rather uh, short lifetime, your turn on on the IV is actually uh, quite different in, in terms of voltage and the non-ideality that you could extract in principle should be quite different as well. So this is a real engine. Um, and by now the uh, MOSFET should probably have completed. So let me go in here. So now here's my second simulations with a uh, simulation where I made it from 100 to 65 and this transistor still behaves pretty well but if let me go down let me uh, jump to 22 it's going to run and we should see how um, terrible that transistor is starting to to be if it's just a standard uh, 2d scaled device so that'll run for a minute uh, maybe I, I, I could take some questions and chat and, and maybe uh, point to some new new things. Ah. So go ahead, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. And I can go to other tools if you have questions about other tools. Um, many of the tools I know, I, or I know what to find. So it doesn't have to be just these um, say educational um, or semiconductor tools. Um, so you mentioned something about the virtual reality uh, uh, within the FAB system. Yeah. Yeah. If, if that's something that you can quickly um, describe, yeah. that would be helpful. Yeah, it's, uh, it's um. It, right now, it's um, it's a faculty uh, done by a faculty member that is joining Purdue in the fall, and we haven't fully integrated his uh, tool set, but it's it's VFab Lab, and basically it, it allows you to walk into a fab and and uh, open an evaporator, see what is inside, push some buttons um, to uh, uh, to train. Um, students to come into a fab and he's been using that extensively at KAUST um, and uh, we're integrating that into NanoHub and ultimately what I want to see is not only see the mechanics of operating this thing but actually then hooking up a process modeling engine under the hood to say yeah, I'm going to hand in from a certain set of wafers that I have I'm going to oxidize them and you can change the oxidation um, environment with the with this virtual tool and then we simulate what the profiles might be etc to really make this a virtual experience great thank you so by the way the my 22 nanometer transistor is here the uh, here's my 65 and here's my 100 nanometer transistor and you can see how how cruddy this transistor gets and you can begin to explain um, short channel effects by looking at um, contour plots of uh, 
of the electron concentration and or the um, the uh, contour plot of the final bias. So if I, I don't want to look at all, right? So here's my long transistor channel is well defined. Um, potential under the transistor is well defined, reasonably well controlled. And as I make it smaller and smaller, you can see that that the barrier is less and less defined. You have much less field lines under the gate. So you lose control of the gate. So you can very easily see how you have a short channel effects really rapidly emerging. Um, let me see if I can do the same. So here's for the initial, that was final bias. Let me do the initial bias. So that's really a low bias. So your source and drain are, are, are close. Um, so here is the long device, 100 nanometers. And as you um, scan it down, you can see how your you really your field lines under the gate are, are not really being controlled by the gate much at all. You're really punching through the, the electric field and you can call that barrier lowering, if you will. You can visibly see it like this. And this comes out for free in a real device simulator. It's not a toy, right? That That's my whole point. I mean, this is again, an honest to goodness, um, semi-classical transport simulation in a real tool. So this is the input deck you would have to come up with um, to run this kind of uh, tool. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. I don't know. I can I can do more demo, but um, we can also close at forty five minutes. Azad, what would you like to do? Um, I think more demo would be good. Um, there is a question now, Azad. Oh, okay. Um, so the question is: Do you have educational yep. materials paired with these tools to learn how to use them? Yes. So. Um, in each of these tools here, for example, there's another tab. There's some homework assignments that are uh, had been created. These happen to be by Dragica Veseleska. Uh, so she has put together some for this tool. Um, if I go, for example, in this um, PN Junction Lab, there's also homework assignments like this. Um, also, what we have is, Well, let me go here so I show you where to find it. So you go to the home page, click on this guy. You go into this group page, and in this group page, here's the overview page. But so if you go on P injunctions, you find uh, demos and uh, some exercises, some homework exercises accumulated like this. And we have started also to create a faculty only group where faculty can share material and share solutions that we don't necessarily want to be open for everyone. So this, this group page, NanoUp Groups Abacus, is the one that I would point people to as, as the go-to place to find, uh, to find things. And again, you can find it from the homepage by clicking your way through, or you just type abacus and you can get there. Uh, I see a question, can you do longer channels? Yeah, so I, I would say yes. Uh, the question is, uh, can you simulate longer channels range such, such as five and 10 micron? I'm not sure about, uh, yeah, in principle, yes. and. I haven't done it, is the caveat. But what I would argue for is that this tool was actually originally built for 
transistor, or well, this tool, this Padre engine was actually built for more macro scale transistors, right? So if you go in uh, tools, MOSFET, launch it. Um, I just want to get back to the default uh, setting. So, so I accessed MOSFET, not from within Abacus. Um, you can certainly ramp these up. So if, um, I, and I don't know how far you can go. So if you go 100, nan 100 nanometer contacts, 0.1, but you said tens of microns. So, so let's just do one micrometer. Um, So one micrometer, thousand nanometers. I'm just scaling this up. Um, Ten nanometer oxide uh, junction depth. Make it also larger, maybe fifty. Um, substrate probably also larger. So let's see. I haven't done this. So this could choke, but in principle, this tool was originally built for semi-classical devices, right? It's a drift diffusion for semi-classical devices. So there's no reason why it couldn't, shouldn't scale up to larger uh, devices. You might have to muck around with it, uh, nodes and oxide thickness and the nodes. So meshing is obviously always an issue with these kind of simulations. But let's see. I mean, it's running this thing for a much larger device than what the default is. And I presume it, it should work OK. Again, it's a generic tool. It's a general tool. So now it complains about convergence problem. Let's see. Let's see what plots we get back. And Let's see. I, I again, I don't know. I and I have not optimized any node number uh, number of numerical nodes to resolve this device. So let's see. Yeah, that doesn't look very hot. Um, Contact plot of potential of initial bias. Yeah, the gate looks pretty good, but looks like all of this stuff is not very well resolved. So you probably have to increase more nodes and do the meshing, right? But I think it's in principle doable. I don't see why this is not doable. Uh, there's another question this time in chat. Where do you go to access the virtual reality content? Yeah, I would, uh, the easy way is, um, here in this, in this workforce development page that you reach from the homepage and you go into the virtual fab here, and click here. Okay. So that gets you off of NanoHub. This is not integrated yet in NanoHub. So, um, you know, if if um, if someone has developed uh, a website or something like this, that they still want to keep it on their own um, website, is it possible to um, have a pointer on it on NanoHub if yeah. you approve it? And uh, uh, that, I mean, that would be uh, certainly welcome. We should. Think about how to place it and where to place it, but in principle, that that should be open, right? It's NanoHub doesn't have to be the in all for all, um, but we certainly would want to partner with people and point to each other's resources, right? Right. Right. Um, another question. Uh, okay. What is the process of getting virtual reality applications approved and submitted? Are those simulation tools, I guess, rather than this? Virtual? So I think maybe, so 
when, when you say virtual reality, is this about the 3D goggle, you know, headsets that people put and they right. see? That's what this is. This is where you walk into a room and, 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 and sort of operate a tool in a very simple way, right? There's no true operation, but at least you know what it might look like and um, what kind of buttons it has and how big something is. Um, so, so that is that by itself was a development under, undertaken here by uh, Professor Hussain. And uh, I mean, he had a team of people actually creating this virtual reality, right? That was one effort. Um, that is, in a sense, very different from building simulation tools or putting user interfaces onto very complicated tools and making them useful. And for that second one, we have our own processes that I could highlight. Mm -hmm. If that's the question, I can I can address that more easily. So um, a follow-up question not related to this. In general, if you could comment a little bit about the process of um, developing a tool or an app on NanoHub. So imagine one of the people and you know some of the people on the, in the audience, they have developed a new modeling framework, a simulation tool. They've mm -hmm. done it either with MATLAB or some other uh, software. Now yeah. they want to uh, host it on NanoHub. How, how much work is it? How, how involved is it? Where are the good resources for that? That would be very helpful. Sure. So just as a highlight, um, in this overview here, there is at least uh, four different tools that are being used under the hood. They're not all the same, even the same engine, right? For example, um, the Carrier Statistics Lab, Drift Diffusion Lab, BJT, PN Junctions, MOS Capacitor, and MOSFET they run this Padre tool, which is an old ancient Fortran code, right? That we wrapped into a, a nice user interfaces. Uh, this tool here, Crystal Viewer Band Structure Lab, uh, is running truly Nemo 5 simulation, which it's its own um, a piece of software and framework. Uh, these two here are uh, this one is a precursor, a MATLAB prototype of NEMO 5, and this is actually a custom piece of MATLAB code, right? So you can embed any which code you want, and you can put similar looking interfaces on top of it, and we have the inf infrastructure to do so. And the way you actually do it is following. There's a tool called, well, I'll show you from the homepage. So you start to develop software, you can go to a Linux workstation, you launch basically a Unix workstation in your browser in which you uh, install effectively your own software. And then we have a publication process for this software. So if I, um, So here, here's an example of a tool, a quantum.lab that I had developed and I updated it last fall for my students. Um, so you can develop the tool in here and prototype it, et cetera, and, and play with it. And, and uh, then you would publish it through a publication process that we have defined. And then students would be able to or anybody, right? anybody, not your students, um, any user would reach this final product that had multiple versions, right? So it gets updated. And here's the same tool um, that when you, when you launch it, it looks quite similar to what you had seen here in the development side. So here's my structure. I can put in the pyramidal dot. I can run it. And um, I have a tool that I published. So this particular tool framework uh, and um, embedding of NEMO 5 was done actually by undergrad students. So it's not that hard to do. So, and then you can 
use widgets that we have, for example, use a 3D rendering of a, of a quantum dot wave function, uh, px, py, and then z has a different uh, symmetry, etc. So, so these are widgets we provide, and you can deploy tools like this. And there's over 700 tools in Nanolab now that come from all over the place. Great, great. Um, and I assume there is somewhere um, a more formal documentation about. Yeah, we have uh, short courses on how to do that. We have uh, tutorials and we have documentation about this framework, right? And believe it or not, after not having done it for many years, I go back to the documentation and look up the widgets and the details, right? So, Yes. So I use it. I know it exists. Can also right. um, uh, we are almost uh, at four o'clock. If there are no more questions, um, we may Thank Gerhard for the very, very interesting and uh, useful presentation. Uh, there's, there's a whole world of resources available here. And um, this is a, an environment that everyone can contribute and benefit from. So we really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, the highlights with us. Okay. And um, I'm sure uh, you and your colleagues are available to help if um, people have questions and, and, yeah. and uh, need help. So um, I can just uh, mention from my experience, my students have um, uploaded a few uh, of their tools on NanoHelp and they're being cited and used quite frequently. And, and it's been a very um, rewarding experience for the students and for us. So I'm, I'm sure others will have uh, similar stories to share. Great. Thank you so much. Um, for the endorsement. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so I thank everybody for attending. Uh, I'm not popping up my thank you note on PowerPoint. I think we're good. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Azad. Thank you, Gerhard. And thank you everyone for attending. And we'll see you at the next uh, NNCI webinar. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.